Our tour guide today is Roy Martin, fighter pilot in the Vietnam War and former chief test pilot of Northrop Grumman Integrated Systems. He's going to explain the Northrop F-5A Freedom Fighter. Hey, welcome to the Western Museum of Flight. My name is Roy Martin and uh, I'm uh, very privileged to be one of the docents here. Today I wanted to talk about one of my favorite displays, which is the F-5A. I think one of the reasons it's my favorite is because I have about 2,500 hours of, uh, as a fighter pilot and a test pilot in the T-38, F-5A, and the F-5E series. So today I'd like to give you some insights into, even though the three models of the airplane uh, look very similar, there are some subtle differences, and yet those subtle differences can have some significant impacts uh, when you get, especially to the fringes of the flight envelope. Now the T-38, the F-5A, and the F-5E, when you're in the heart of the envelope, they all fly very similar. Very excellent responsive airplanes. But it's when you get out to the, start doing maneuvering at the very low speed, high angle of attack, that some of the subtle differences of the airplane come into play. So today for Test Pilot 101, let's talk about how some of those subtle changes uh, affect the flying qualities. So let's start with a little T-38 here. Notice that the nose on the T-38 is kind of a round nose. And when you do a full elastic stall in a T-38, this round nose, you have some vortex flow coming off the nose, some wash, if you will. And even though one of these may be getting a little bit strong if you got side slip, the airplane yaws and then immediately banks and then corrects the side slip. So when you're doing the full elastic stall, the airplane just kind of as a slow wing rock, develops a sink rate, and forward stick instantly recovers the airplane. Very safe airplane to fly. No real issues at all in the flying qualities at high angle attack. However, if you'll notice, the F-5A has a slightly different nose shape. And it was caused by the fact that they had to accommodate these guns. So to accommodate the guns, they had to spread out the nose. And that created more of an oval shape in the nose instead of more of the round nose. Now when they went to the F-5E model, you'll notice that the nose is even flatter because they had to accommodate a radar dish, and to accommodate the shape of the dish, the nose shape was changed, and so we have even a more flatter nose on the E model. Now, the significance of that is as follows. If you get into the stall, full lap stick stall, hang of attack qualities of this airplane, or in the F5E model, the vortex starts to show, and if, if I may use this model, you'll see as some vortex comes off of the airplane, you start to get a little side slip on the airplane, you'll get a strong vortex on one side, and that will actually set up a yaw rate. But if you're operating at a high angle of attack, that yaw rate generates a lifting motion. So you can actually have an inadvertent, if you will, pitch up of the airplane uh, caused by maneuvering at the high angle of attack with these kind of airplanes. And, uh, in, in the case where you're flying at a forward or a mid-CG, really it's not a problem. Forward stick recovers the airplane, and you really don't have an issue. But if you get more to the FCG, where the moment arm from these forces has more effect on the airplane, the pitch up can actually be to such an extent that you get to a point where the fuselage blanks the tail, and now there's nothing to stop the vortex from causing a rotating motion and the airplane can enter a spin. So we went from a T-38, which really doesn't have a spin mode, to an F-5A, which is hard to spin but can be done, to an F-5E, to eventually the F-5F. Now this is where our problem came up with these changes in nose shape. When they made the F model, they took the E model, the single seat, chopped the fuselage, moved it forward 40 inches, dropped in a rear uh, cockpit, and now all of these issues that were related to the nose of the airplane from this differential vortex flow has a longer moment arm by 40 inches. And what that meant was in the case of the F5F, especially at FCG, when you had the vortex start, the nose would come up very abrupt, and it was uh, much easier to get to a point where the tail was blanked and you were in a spin condition. We had one test point where a moderate rate input actually resulted in this thing entering a spin um, after just three seconds of full lap stick. Consequently, for the F5F, the two-seat version of the E model, we had to put an angle of attack limit on the airplane 
of 29 units, which is approximately 29 degrees angle of attack. The wing stalls at 26 degrees, so you could still operate the airplane to stall, but anything in the post-stall region, the pilots had to be careful, because if it got in as high as like 45 degrees angle of attack and the tail was blank, then you could have a problem of the nose not coming down with the forward stick, and you could end up with a spin. So this is just a sample of how a very subtle change in the nose shape of the airplane had fairly dramatic effects in the high angle of attack maneuvering of the airplane. I have another example I'll show you back at the wing. Another area that we can talk about, which looked like a fairly subtle change to the, when we went from the T-38 to the F-5, which again had fairly significant effect on the handling qualities of the airplane, it turns out to be a little housing that you see right here. Now you notice that on a T-38, the wing comes directly into the fuselage, and there is no little, what we call, leading edge extension or little housing there. So why do we have one on an F-5A, and what was that changes in the effect of the flying qualities? Well, when they went to the, from the T-38 to the F-5, they had external hard points. They could carry bombs, they could carry fuel tanks, so the weight of the airplane went up, and they needed additional lift on the wing to be able to slow the airplane back down so it could land on like the standard 8,000 foot NATO standard runway for the foreign military operations of the aircraft. So to do that, they incorporated, Northrop engineers incorporated a leading edge flap. And that changed the camber of the wing, which allowed it to fly back down to the normal approach speeds, even with the increased weight. But to run that leading edge flap, they needed an electric motor and they needed a place to put the electric motor, so they put it right up in this area right here, and they built this little housing, this little triangular-shaped housing around it, and said, okay, we're good to go. And when they put it in the wind tunnel and started increasing the angle of attack, increasing the angle of attack, they got to the point where they assumed the airplane would stall, and it didn't stall. They kept higher angle of attack, it kept flying. It kept flying. Finally, they did get to an angle of attack where it stalled. But there was a region there of what they called free lift. Where did that come from? So going back to the analysis, they said, ah, I think we understand what's going on now. The airflow, the angle of attack airflow, coming up at high angle of attack, forms a little vortex. And when it sheds off of this lex, it sheds across the wing and forms kind of like an aerodynamic fence. It's like a mini tornado going across the wing. Now the arc part of the wing can go spanwise and stall, but this part of the wing kept flying. And it kept flying until eventually the vortex lifted off the wing and then you had a stall. Aha! That's called vortex-induced lift. And it became a feature of this airplane because it allowed, in your turn capability at slow speed, allowed you to have a, a better turn capability. So, if it's a little bit of housing is good, in the case of the F5E, they made even a bigger vortex-induced lift called the LEX, and again, optimized so that the vortex would shed across the wing, keep a good fly here, even though this part of the airflow was separating, this was all good. So for positive angles of attack, high angle of attack maneuvering, the LEX was great. And if you see an F18, you'll see that the LEX is even larger, and all of that is called vortex-induced lift. That's positive high angles of attack maneuvering. And it was an accidental find uh, that was based on this uh, little motor driving that flap. However, for every good thing, sometimes there can be a bad thing. And in this case, the bad thing occurs when you go to negative Gs, which induces negative angles of attack. So let's take a look at that condition and why did that end up being a flying qualities issue. When the, when the leading edge flap was down and you start to get airflow coming at negative angles of attack, the, it, you got to a point at minus six degrees angle of attack where the airflow could not make it around the turn radius and you had sudden dramatic separation of airflow all across the wing, except the Lex was still flying. What happened, because the LEX is still flying, this part of the airflow is separated, but this is still good, you had a forward shift in the lift distribution, or a forward shift in the center of pressure, as we say, and at minus six degrees angle of attack, the airplane started to tuck all by itself to minus 18 degrees angle of attack, 
where the stabilator was now effective at stopping it. But now you were stuck upside down and full ass stick stall could not get you in through this region. This was termed the region of inverted pitch hangup. Now, um, the um, uh, additional problem is once you're stuck in this region, any kind of side slip or any kind of rudder motion, this fin going through the air is very effective and it'll start to induce a roll. So you end up with a maneuver that's negative G's, very violent mo motion like that. And that's the problem with the inverted pitch hangup. It can lead to a negative G, very disorienting condition if it's not corrected. Now, uh, what was the fix? Well, the engineers went back and said, what was the cause? The initial cause was the leading edge flaps being down. Why don't we bring those up? Let's reattach the airflow. Let's bring the lift distribution back so that part B, aft stick, will recover the airplane and bring it down through this region. So a very brave test pilot named Dick Thomas from Northrop Grumman was asked to go up and intentionally put himself in these maneuvers of, of, of very violent maneuvers and then bring the flaps up, stick aft, and see if it would recover the airplane. And the answer was yes, it will recover the airplane. However, it takes several thousand feet of altitude loss before the airplane uh, will recover. So that's the story, if you will, of the inverted pitch hangup. Now later on, what Northrop engineers did when they come out with the later models on the F5E model, they fed angle of attack through a computer that drove the flaps, and so when you went through zero degrees angle of attack, the leading edge flap automatically came up. So you, as a pilot, didn't have to remember to do it. And therefore, that essentially took care of the problem of the inverted pitch hangup. Again, I wanted to go today over just a few subtle changes. Even though the T-38, F-5A, and F-5E look very similar, sometimes just a little bit of subtle change to the external mode line can have a rather significant effect on the flying qualities of the airplane as you get to the very extremes of the flight envelope. Well, this is what we do here at the Western Museum of Flight. We have these airplanes. We have this information available. Please, I invite you to come down so we can share our experiences with you. Thank you.